Number 13, Isabella Guzman. In August 2013, a troubled 18-year-old woman named Isabella Guzman murdered her mother, Yunmi Hoy, at their home in Aurora, Colorado. The teen killer stabbed the victim 79 times, giving Yunmi Hoy no chance of surviving the brutal attack. Guzman's behavioral issues date back to her childhood. In the months leading up to the murder, she allegedly became increasingly disrespectful and threatening toward Hoy. The escalating tensions between mother and daughter reached their breaking point shortly after Guzman spat in Hoy's face during an argument. Guzman then sent her mother an email that said, you will pay, prompting Hoy to call the police. Responding officers warned Guzman that her mother could legally evict her, but they didn't make any arrests. Later that evening, Hoy arrived home from work and went to take a shower, and that's when Guzman entered the bathroom, locked the door, and stabbed her mother to death, while her stepfather helplessly tried to break down the door. By the time he dialed 911 and Guzman finally exited the bathroom, it was too late to save Hoy. Guzman fled the scene and was picked up nearby the next day in her blood-covered clothing. During Guzman's trial, mental health experts testified that she suffered from untreated schizophrenia. She was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was sentenced indefinitely to a state mental hospital. Seven years later, in 2020, Guzman claimed that her mental illness was under control and petitioned the court for her release. Around this time, footage from one of her court proceedings after the murder surfaced on social media. The video showed the young woman making bizarre facial expressions and smirking at the camera. At first glance, this appears to be the behavior of a remorseless, cold-hearted killer. But even the prosecutor agreed that Guzman was delusional and didn't know right from wrong when she murdered Hoy. For now, she remains institutionalized. There's no fixed release date for her sentence, so she could be released at any time if it's decided that she's no longer a threat to herself or others. Number 12, Frank De Leon Jr. Diamond Alvarez left her home in Houston to walk her dog one day in early 2022 and never returned home. The high school student was found clinging to life on a sidewalk after being shot 22 times from behind. And sadly, she'd been left for dead. By the time help arrived, she'd already succumbed to her injuries. Investigators soon discovered that Alvarez had met up with her recent ex-boyfriend, Frank De Leon Jr., whom she'd broken up with after discovering that he cheated on her. Prior to the meeting, De Leon had sent Alvarez a text message asking her to keep their interactions a secret. Police found De Leon at his home with a suitcase full of clothing and toiletries on his bed, indicating that they'd caught him as he was packing to skip town. He was charged with murder and was released on house arrest after paying $250,000 bail. Chaos broke out in the courtroom during De Leon's trial in October 2023, when Alvarez's mother, Anna Machado, rushed at a defendant after giving her victim impact statement. She would later claim that De Leon had laughed in her face during the emotional speech. As a deputy blocked Machado, Alvarez's uncle ran over and punched De Leon several times. Once the deputy's attention had turned to the uncle, De Leon's mother jumped in and fought with Machado. The fights carried on for a few minutes before order was restored. In the end, De Leon pleaded guilty to murder in exchange for a 45-year sentence, and he'll become eligible for parole halfway through the term. Number 11, Bo Hampton Rothwell. 28-year-old Jennifer Rothwell vanished in Creve Corps, Missouri in November 2019 when she was six weeks pregnant. She was reported missing by her husband, 28-year-old Bo Rothwell, who claimed that he'd last seen his wife early that morning when she left for work. As police got to work on the case, Bo participated in search efforts to find his missing wife. Shortly after her disappearance, Jennifer's car was found abandoned along a roadside with her cell phone inside. A search of the phone revealed that she'd recently googled what to do if your husband is upset you are pregnant. Naturally, this heightened detective's suspicions against Bo, and as they scrutinized his version of events, they quickly discovered lies and details that didn't add up. When asked where he was on the night before Jennifer disappeared, Bo claimed that he spent the entire evening at home. Yet surveillance footage from a local store showed him buying rubber gloves and cleaning supplies in the middle of a blizzard, a time when most people don't leave their houses unless they absolutely have to. During a search of the Rothwells' home, investigators discovered a portion of carpeting soaked with bleach and Jennifer's blood, which had seeped into the padding below. 
A garage window had been left open in the 30-degree weather in an apparent attempt to air out the bleach smell. Police also noticed a distinct odor of bleach in the bed of Bo's pickup truck, and mounting evidence was enough to arrest him on suspicion of Jennifer's murder. Bo confessed to the crime, claiming that he flew into a rage and killed his wife during an argument about an affair he was having with a mystery woman, whom he refused to name. He led law enforcement to the location of Jennifer's body in a wooded area along a highway, roughly 45 miles from the couple's residence. And a subsequent autopsy showed that she'd been bludgeoned to death. During his trial, Bo took the stand in an attempt to convince the jury that his actions were not premeditated. He tried to make them believe that he'd lost self-control in the heat of the moment. He described approaching Jennifer from behind and striking her in the back of the head with a mallet. And as Jennifer stumbled away, Bo struck her again. So his attorney argued for a conviction on a lesser manslaughter charge. Prosecutors argued that Bo's actions were planned out in advance and urged the jury to find him guilty of murder. As evidence for a motive, the state presented a handwritten list Bo had made months before Jennifer's death, containing the pros and cons of ending his marriage. In the cons section, he wrote, have to move, half my assets, money, possibly get another job, and family disappointment. The jury found Bo Rothwell guilty of murder, tampering with evidence and abandonment of a corpse, and as a result, he was sentenced to life without parole. Number 10. Scott Johnson On a summer day in July 2008, a group of nine teenagers beat the heat by visiting a popular swimming hole along the Menominee River near the Wisconsin-Michigan border. But out of nowhere, they were attacked by an onslaught of bullets, leaving Tiffany Polson, Anthony Spigarelli, and Brian Mort dead at the scene. Another group member survived with injuries after being struck by shrapnel. The shooter, a 38-year-old unemployed plumber and army veteran from Michigan named Scott Johnson, hid in the woods overnight before turning himself in. He told police that he'd assaulted a woman the day before the shooting and knew law enforcement would be looking for him. So he hatched a plan to lure officers into the woods by shooting visitors at the swimming hole. He then planned to take out as many cops as possible during the ensuing manhunt. But he surrendered after failing to get a good enough view to shoot any officers. Those who knew Johnson described him as a loner with few friends. He became bitter and angry after his wife left him and moved out of state with their children in 2001, and his resentment only grew in the seven years leading up to the murders. To avoid paying child support, he quit his job and refused to get another one, instead leeching off his mother while self-medicating with alcohol and marijuana. Johnson blamed his killing spree on his anger toward the system for revoking custody of his children and said that it was his way of lashing back. After initially entering an insanity plea, Johnson pleaded no contest to 10 charges, including three counts of first-degree intentional homicide, six counts of attempted first-degree intentional homicide, and one assault charge. While waiting to be formally sentenced to life in prison without parole, he told the Associated Press that the murders were very easy to do. In a terrifying display of indifference, Johnson compared the killings to spilled milk, stating, Do you get all upset about it? No, you just clean it up. He blatantly refused to apologize to the victim's surviving family members during the interview and in court, further proving that he didn't feel one ounce of remorse over his actions. Number 9. Coral Edgar 26-year-old Lee McKnight thought he was going to his ex-girlfriend Coral Edgar's home for a booty call during the early morning hours in July of 2020. But he owed money to a drug dealer named Jamie Davison, who was lying in wait with two other men when McKnight arrived at Edgar's home in Carlisle, England at 2 a.m. Davison and his accomplices ambushed McKnight and tied him to a chair. They spent the next two hours punching and kicking him and whipping him with a riding crop belonging to Coral's mother. When McKnight was nearly dead, the men wrapped him in a carpet, drove him to a nearby river using a vehicle owned by Coral's mother, and dumped him in the water. In the meantime, Coral cleaned up the mess left behind by the brutal assault. McKnight's body was found by a farmer several hours later. It bore telltale signs of an agonizing death, including 36 blunt force trauma injuries to the head, a skull fracture, broken ribs, a broken neck bone, and a brain bleed. The medical examiner concluded that he was still alive when he was tossed into the river and ruled his cause of death as drowning. 
According to investigators, Davison became desperate to recover McKnight's drug debt because he also owed money to dealers higher up on the chain. After driving around and failing to find him, he persuaded Coral to lure the victim over with the promise of intimacy. Coral denied participating in the beating, claiming that she sat in the other room with her eyes closed and ears covered. She was nevertheless convicted of her role in McKnight's murder, along with Davison, his two accomplices, Coral's mother, and the father of one of the co-conspirators, who burned one of the suspect's blood-stained clothing. All six defendants were sentenced to life in prison with minimum terms ranging from 13 to 30 years. Davison received the harshest sentence while Coral was sentenced to a minimum of 13 and a half years. Number 8. Cosmo Donado over a two-day period in July 2017, four young men vanished in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 19-year-old Jimmy Patrick was the first to disappear, followed by 19-year-old Dean Finicchiaro, 21-year-old Thomas Mio, and 22-year-old Mark Sturgis. Two days after the last of the four men went missing, Thomas Mio's car was found on a 90-acre farm owned by the family of 20-year-old Cosmo Donado, who had recently tried selling the vehicle. Investigators also traced Dean Finicchiaro's cell phone signal to the property. Donado came from a wealthy family that owned a cement business. He had over 30 previous run-ins with the police and a history of mental illness and violent outbursts, which included physical attacks and threats to kill family members but he'd never been convicted of a crime and was released from a psychiatric institution just a week after being admitted due to homicidal thoughts. During a search of Donado's property, police found the bodies of Mio, Sturgis, and Finicchiaro in a deep grave that had been dug using a backhoe. The remains had been placed into a metal tank, and they were doused with gasoline before they were set on fire and buried. Jimmy Patrick's body was found in a separate grave nearby, and all four men had been shot to death. Donado confessed to luring all four victims to their deaths under the guise of selling marijuana to them, claiming that he felt cheated over past drug transactions. He carried out three of the murders with help from his second cousin, Sean Michael Kratz. In 2018, Donado pleaded guilty to all four murders and received four consecutive life terms with no chance of parole. Kratz, on the other hand, rejected a plea deal which would have made him eligible for parole after serving 59 years in prison and was found guilty of first-degree murder, second-degree murder, and voluntary manslaughter. And as a result, he was sentenced to life without parole. Number 7. Philip Melinda and Kelly Jones Jared Davidson married Kelly Jones in 2000 after she got pregnant. He filed for divorce a few years later after trying to make the relationship work for the sake of their daughter, but he was getting fed up with his meddling in-laws and their influence over his wife. Both Jared and Kelly fought for full custody of their daughter. The judge granted Kelly primary custody while Jared received weekend visits. Angry that Jared had won any rights at all, Kelly accused him of abuse, which he adamantly denied and no evidence was ever found to back up the claim. Determined to juggle fatherhood with his studies as a grad student at the University of California in Santa Barbara, Jared once again filed for full custody in 2004. But less than three weeks before the next scheduled court hearing, someone shot him in the chest in the doorway of his home, and sadly he died on the way to the hospital. At the scene, police found a potted plant with a card bearing Jared's name in childlike handwriting, leading them to believe that his killer lured him outside with the delivery. A witness saw two people running from the scene, but they were unable to provide any identifying features. When law enforcement delivered the tragic news about Jared's death to his parents, they immediately suspected that Kelly was involved. Kelly was able to prove that she was 90 miles away at the time of the murder, but she had nothing nice to say about Jared, and neither did the people in her life. Her new boyfriend told investigators that Jared manufactured drugs in the chemistry lab at his college campus, a claim that was similar to allegations made by Kelly's parents, Philip and Melinda Jones, which turned out not to be true. The Joneses claimed that Jared wasn't a good person, yet he was well liked by pretty much everyone else who knew him. Like their daughter, Philip and Melinda claimed that they were far away at the time of Jared's murder, but they were unable to prove it. The case began falling together when a deputy remembered seeing the potted plant at a local store, and while viewing surveillance footage from the night of the crime, he noticed a person in bulky clothes grabbing the plant and cardholder while covering their face. 
The video showed the person touching the cardholder with their bare hand, and a DNA test yielded a female profile. Based on the person's mannerisms, detectives suspected that it was Kelly. To their surprise, though, the DNA turned up as a match to Melinda Jones. Confident that Melinda didn't act alone, investigators performed extensive surveillance on her and Philip, and in doing so, they discovered that Philip had lied about injuring his arm in a car accident, leading them to believe that he was the shooter. In early 2005, more than six months after Jared's death, Melinda and Philip were charged with murder. Prosecutors believed that Kelly was involved in the plot and was perhaps even the mastermind, but they dropped most of the charges against her in exchange for Philip's willingness to plead guilty. He was sentenced to 25 years to life and died behind bars from lung cancer less than two years later. Kelly pleaded guilty to two counts of perjury and one count of being an accessory and was sentenced to four years in prison. Melinda took her case to trial and tried acting mentally ill during the proceedings, claiming that she had amnesia and using a baby-like tone while talking to her attorney. The jury didn't buy her act, though, and she was sentenced to life in prison. Number 6. Melody Felicano Johnson While stationed in Germany in early 2023, U.S. Air Force Airman Roby Johnson began to notice that his coffee tasted strange. At the time, he and his wife, 39-year-old Melody Felicano Johnson, were in the process of divorcing, but they still lived together, and Roby suspected that Melody was trying to poison him with bleach. To confirm his suspicions, Roby installed hidden cameras and began testing the coffee with a swimming pool chemical kit. He wanted to wait until he and Melody returned to the US to report her to the police, so he focused on gathering evidence. The coffee tested positive for high levels of chlorine on multiple occasions, while the tap water from the sink repeatedly tested normal. Videos captured by the hidden cameras showed Melody pouring something into the coffee, but when Roby showed the footage to the police upon his return to Arizona, they said it wasn't clear enough to identify the substance being poured. Determined to catch his estranged wife in the act, Roby bought more cameras and installed them elsewhere throughout the home. And soon enough, he returned to the police with footage that appeared to show Melody pouring bleach from a big bottle into a smaller container inside their laundry room. She then proceeded into the kitchen and poured the liquid into the coffee maker. This time, police were willing to make an arrest, and Melody was taken into custody on suspicion of attempted homicide, attempted aggravated assault, and adding poison to a food or drink. According to court documents, Roby believes that she was trying to kill him so she could collect his military benefits. Melody pleaded not guilty and remains held at the Pima County Jail on a $250,000 bond. Bleach is a highly corrosive liquid, and prolonged ingestion can lead to death. Just one to two mouthfuls can irritate the mouth, throat, and gastrointestinal tract, leading to abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Had Roby shrugged off his suspicions and continued drinking his coffee, he would have likely experienced excruciating symptoms, as well as possible permanent internal damage, or worse. Number 5. David Shockey during a weekend getaway with her girlfriends in March 2014, 41-year-old Shelley Shockey confided that her marriage to her husband, 37-year-old David Shockey, was in trouble. She suspected that David was cheating, so she was likely surprised when she arrived home and he told her he had a surprise for her in the basement of their Marion, Ohio home. Lured by the prospect of a romantic evening, Shelley called off work and went downstairs. David then blindfolded her in anticipation of revealing the surprise, but strangled her and cut her throat in what prosecutor Brent Yeager would later describe as the most brutal attack he'd ever seen. A concerned friend called the police the next day after being unable to reach Shelley. Shockey initially told police that his wife had run off with another man, but they noticed suspicious injuries on his face and neck. Under mounting pressure, he eventually confessed to killing his wife, and hiding her body in the basement of the home beneath some boxes and blankets. As it turned out, Shelley's suspicions about David cheating were correct. For more than a year, he'd been having an affair with a 19-year-old woman named Danielle Crokey, who helped him plot Shelley's murder so they could be together. According to prosecutors, David chose to kill his wife instead of divorcing her because he wanted to collect on her retirement. He pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and was sentenced to 25 years to life. 
Danielle Crokey admitted that David had texted her after killing Shelley, asking her to come over to make sure the victim was dead. She also helped clean up the crime scene and helped hide the body. Crokey pleaded guilty to complicity to aggravated murder and was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Number 4. James Wan Most people who watch the news probably know by now that hiring a hitman through the dark web is a bad idea. Not only because it's wrong to kill someone, but because most of the websites that offer this service are scams that often lead to the person requesting the assassination getting caught by law enforcement. A 54-year-old doctor from Duluth, Georgia named James Wan learned this lesson the hard way when he was nabbed for trying to have his girlfriend killed through a dark web marketplace in 2022. According to authorities, Wan requested for the woman to be shot and for her death to appear accidental. He told the site's administrator that the hitman could take the victim's car, wallet and phone if they wanted. Then, after accidentally sending an $8,000 down payment to the wrong Bitcoin wallet, Wan sent another $8,000 to the correct recipient. Wan got impatient while waiting for his order to be fulfilled and made a number of posts on the website asking when the request would be carried out and if there was a way for him to check on the progress of the job. After deeming that Wan's intentions seemed serious, a tipster contacted the FBI, who warned Wan's girlfriend of the threat to her life and launched an investigation. Wan abruptly cancelled his order after learning that the feds were on to him. During questioning, he allegedly admitted to detectives that he checked the status of his request daily to see if it had been carried out. As a consequence, he was arrested in May of 2022 and was subsequently fired from his job. Wan pleaded guilty to one count of using a facility of interstate commerce in the commission of murder for hire and is due to be sentenced in early 2024. But his motive for wanting his girlfriend dead remains unclear. Number 3. Kelly Cochran as a creature of habit, 53-year-old divorced father of two, Christopher Regan, was known for being predictable. So when he suddenly stopped showing up for work at his job on Michigan's Upper Peninsula in October 2014, his friends and co-workers knew something was wrong. Regan was planning to move to North Carolina in the near future, but investigators ruled out the likelihood that he'd skipped town. They soon discovered that Regan had been having an affair with his married co-worker, 35-year-old Kelly Cochran, and began to suspect that her husband, Jason, was involved in his disappearance. Former Iron River Police Chief Laura Frizzo later told 2020 that Kelly and Jason's marriage had been troubled for quite some time due to Kelly's habit of living like a single person. During a search of the couple's home, detectives found blood spatter on the ceiling and a diary entry written by Jason, which appeared to include details of a horrific crime. Just hours after the search, the Cochrans packed up and moved to Hobart, Indiana, and without enough evidence to arrest them, law enforcement continued investigating. While searching a body of water near the couple's former home, divers found what appeared to be a burn barrel with a cement block tied to it, but there was nothing inside of the drum. Some of Regan's bones were eventually found at a local park, but it still wasn't enough to make an arrest. Two years after Regan's disappearance, Kelly Cochran dialed 911 and reported that Jason wasn't breathing. Emergency responders failed to revive him, and the medical examiner concluded that he died from asphyxiation. After learning that Kelly was suspected in a missing persons case in Michigan, the FBI got involved. During an interview with 2020, Detective Jeremy Ogden described his efforts to get Kelly to open up about what happened. He kept close tabs on her, and he noticed that she frequently sat on a specific bench at a local park. Wondering if he could spook Kelly into talking, Ogden carved Chris was here into a nearby tree in an effort to make her think Regan was reaching out to her from beyond the grave. Ogden was waiting and watching during Kelly's next visit to the park when he saw her running through the woods and hightailing it out of the parking lot in her truck. She confessed to Jason's murder later that night, admitting that she'd given him heroin and covered his nose and mouth until he suffocated to death. Kelly also revealed that Jason had killed Christopher Regan as part of a twisted pact they'd made that if either of them cheated, their partner would kill the other person involved in the affair. She initially blamed Jason entirely for Regan's death, but eventually admitted that she knew about the plan to kill him ahead of time and that she'd lured Regan to her and Jason's home. The couple then dismembered the victim's body. In a disturbing twist, neighbors claimed that they overheard the Cochrans using power tools on the night Regan was murdered. 
and a little while later, the couple allegedly invited them over for a barbecue where they were serving lots of meat. These claims were never included in the official case, but the neighbor said that they were left wondering if they'd eaten human flesh. Kelly Cochran was convicted of murdering both Regan and her husband, and she's currently serving life without parole. Number two, Aurelio Diaz and Philip Stapleton. After leaving work at 1 a.m. one day in July of 2023, 22-year-old Ashley Voss drove home to her grandmother's house and decided to relax in her car before going inside. Out of nowhere, though, someone fired a gunshot through the rear windshield of her car. Ashley dialed 911 but was unable to speak as she died from a bullet wound to the back of the head. Surveillance footage from near the crime scene showed two men approaching the property. One of the suspects could be seen nearing Ashley's car and firing the fatal gunshot at 1.14 a.m., which was exactly the same time that Ashley stopped responding to text messages from the father of her son, 32-year-old Philip Stapleton. Police identified Stapleton as one of the men in the video, while the suspect who was seen pulling the trigger was identified as his close friend, 32-year-old Aurelio Diaz. During an initial interview, Stapleton told police that he and Diaz had planned to prank Ashley by having Diaz defecate on her porch. He claimed that shooting Ashley wasn't part of their plan. With investigators listening in, he called Diaz and asked him about the crime. Diaz allegedly admitted to committing the shooting and was charged with premeditated first-degree murder murder, and for now, he remains held without bond at the Hillsborough County Jail. At first, the father of Ashley's child was considered a witness in the case, but something about the situation didn't add up, according to Ashley's grandmother, Rhonda Voss, who told local station WFLA that her granddaughter and Diaz were acquaintances but not friends. Voss said that Diaz had no motive to kill Ashley and that the two barely knew each other. According to court documents, the slain woman's relative said that state Stapleton had threatened her in reference to an ongoing child support issue. More than two weeks after Ashley's death, Stapleton was charged with conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and principal to first-degree murder. Then, shortly after his arrest, he was hit with additional first-degree murder and tampering charges in connection with an unrelated homicide that occurred back in 2021. The victim in the earlier incident was reportedly found dead along a roadside, but details on the case remain scarce. At the moment, Stapleton is being held without bail pending the outcomes of his charges. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. Number one, Martin McNeil. 50-year-old mother of eight, Michelle McNeil, looked fantastic for her age, but her husband, Martin, a highly respected physician and a pillar of their community in Pleasant Grove, Utah, convinced her that she needed to get some work done. So, wanting to please her husband, she underwent a surgical facelift in April of 2007. During her recovery, Michelle relied on Martin to administer her medication, but three days after the procedure, the couple's daughter Alexis found her unresponsive. Thankfully, though, she survived. Martin said that he'd probably over-medicated his wife by accident, and Alexis took over Michelle's medication management from then on. A few days later, Michelle told Alexis that if anything happened to her, to make sure her father wasn't responsible. That same day, Michelle confronted Martin about an affair he was having with a woman named Gypsy Willis after discovering phone correspondence between her husband and his mistress. Eight days after the facelift, Martin dialed 911 and claimed that he'd found Michelle unresponsive in the bathtub. She was dead, and an initial autopsy ruled that she'd succumbed to cardiovascular disease. But several of the McNeil's children suspected that their father had killed their mother and pushed authorities to reinvestigate the case. An expert concluded that none of the medications in Michelle's system were at lethal levels, but that the combination of the drugs could have led to the cardiovascular symptoms that caused her death. The manner of death was then officially changed to undetermined. It was later discovered that Martin had persuaded Michelle's plastic surgeon to prescribe higher than usual doses of narcotics, including drugs that aren't normally given to facelift patients. For decades, Martin had been living a secret life that consisted of mistresses, a felony fraud conviction, and psychiatric diagnoses that had gotten him discharged from the army. He'd also been collecting disability payments from the military for 30 years, despite working full-time and making a lot of money as a doctor. 
Almost immediately after Michelle's death, Martin moved Gypsy Willis into the family home, and the couple got engaged less than three months later. In the meantime, Martin tried finding another family to take in three of the children he and Michelle had adopted. He sent one of the kids back to Ukraine and conspired with Gypsy to steal her identity as a way to help Gypsy avoid paying the substantial amount of money she owed to the IRS in back taxes. Martin was prosecuted for identity theft in 2009 and received a four-year prison sentence, while Gypsy was sentenced to three years of probation. Finally, in 2012, the state moved forward with a murder a charge against Martin for killing Michelle. Prosecutors accused him of overdosing and drowning his wife, while the defense maintained that Michelle's death was accidental. In the end, though, Martin McNeil was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison, where he died in 2017. Eight human burgers. Picture this, you're on a nice family road trip across the country, but you're starting to get a little hungry. You decide to pull over for a quick bite at a local road stop restaurant. A juicy burger sounds delicious right now, so you order one. Well, little did you know, you'd be biting into a burger full of human meat. The meal was courtesy of none other than the sicko Joe Metheny. Thankfully, he's no longer serving up people, he's just serving time. But how did this all start? You could probably guess that Joe isn't exactly the nicest of guys. So his wife left him and took their son with her. When he found out he'd been abandoned, he was furious and searched everywhere for his family. One of the first places he looked was under a bridge where his wife used to hide out and do drugs. He didn't find her, but there were two other guys that she used to hang out with there. And when they couldn't tell him where his wife and son were, Joe took his anger out on them. He killed them with an axe. And then, when he saw a nearby fisherman witness his actions, he killed him too. But this was just his first go-around with murder, so Joe panicked, dumping the bodies into the river. Authorities took him in and tried to convict him for the crime, but sadly there wasn't enough evidence, allowing Joe to go free and continue his search. Now, with some killing experience, Joe went on to kill two prostitutes too. He took their bodies, raped them, then chopped them up leaving the good parts to be used for burgers, and leaving the rest in an empty lot. With what he kept, he mixed it with pork and beef to make the patties that he would soon sell to unsuspecting customers. In his confession to police, Joe admitted to killing over 10 people and disposing of them this way. What's even more disturbing is that he said he would never have stopped if he hadn't been caught. Since his conviction in 1996, where he received the death penalty, Joe simply waited and rotted away in his prison cell until he was found dead in 2017. The saddest part of all is that he didn't seem to feel guilty or sorry in any way for his unspeakable crimes. What a psycho. 7. Cold Case Dorothy Scott was your typical hard-working single mom, just trying to earn a living and care for her young son, Sean. After a meeting finished up at her job, she realized that one of her co-workers had a strange-looking bite mark on their arm. So being the nice woman she was, Dorothy drove them to the nearest medical center. She then went back to her parents' house where Sean was to check on him, changed into an interesting red scarf, then left again. Her colleagues were waiting for her to come back to the hospital and pick them up after getting checked out. But as her white car pulled into the lot, it made a sharp turn and backed out. Later on, Dorothy's station wagon was found abandoned in an empty alleyway, set on fire. Four years after her disappearance, her bones were found at a construction site. Authorities believe that two years prior to their discovery, a small fire that had broken out in the area caused them to become charred and ashy. Sadly, the mother's cause of death was never determined. There are theories on who could have been responsible, though. Weeks before that fateful night at the hospital, Dorothy kept getting calls from a mysterious number. It was a man on the other side of the phone, and he would say odd and unsettling things like, I've got her, then suddenly hang up. The calls were repeated every week until Dorothy went missing. But in 1984, when her bones were found, they started again. They didn't stop after Dorothy was dead, either. The caller regularly phoned Dorothy's parents, too describing chilling details of her life to them, and even knowing what she was wearing the day she went missing. The man on the line confessed, saying, I killed her. 
He went on to describe how he was in love with Dorothy, but she somehow betrayed him with another man. Despite this confession over the phone, police were never able to trace the number or man that called. Dorothy's supposed killer could still be out there somewhere, roaming the streets and waiting for another victim. 6. Troubles of a Socialite Imagine being born with almost everything you could ever want, money, a prominent family, and one of the most beautiful faces in New York. This just so happened to be the case with the socialite Barbara Bakeland. As an adult, she worked as a model for some of the biggest names in the business, including magazines like Vogue. But hidden just beneath her gorgeous looks were deep-rooted mental health issues. This, of course, was unknown to her future spouse, Brooke Bakeland, a mega-rich pilot who was the grandson of the man that literally invented plastic. With this marriage, Barbara sealed her spot for a life of luxury. But even with more money you'd ever know what to do with, problems can arise. The Bakelands were not a very happy couple. They had a son together named Anthony, but both husband and wife participated in multiple affairs that led to unrest and unhappiness in their lap of luxury. It was bad enough that Barbara tried to take her own life several times. With such a complicated upbringing, Anthony decided to go on his own journey in 1967. During this time, he met a man that he shared an incredibly close and intimate relationship with, and Barbara did not approve. The next part of the story varies depending on who you ask, but many believe that due to Barbara's psychotic episodes, she truly thought the only way her son could be cured of homosexuality was to sleep with him herself. She was, after all, one of the most beautiful women in New York 30 years prior. This damaged Tony even more than anyone could imagine, and he was later diagnosed with schizophrenia. It was around this time that Brooke divorced Barbara, viciously cutting her and their son out of his life. Tony felt an odd connection to his mother, as if she was controlling him. And one night during an argument between the two, Tony struck his mom. She ran into the kitchen to try and get away, but her son grabbed a knife and stabbed her without a single hint of remorse. Due to the money and influence his family had, Tony was sent to a mental hospital called Broadmoor, but was eventually released. Just days after, he tried to kill his own grandmother, one of the only people to take pity on him after the first murder. The police arrived to see him straddling the 87-year-old woman and stabbing her repeatedly. This time, he went straight to jail. You know that saying, more money, more problems? Do you think if this family wasn't so filthy rich, things would have been different for them? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. 5. Co-joined Twins Scientists and ordinary people alike have had a strange obsession with twins for centuries, it seems. From the evil experiments of Dr. Josef Mengele during the Holocaust to TV shows like American Horror Story, twins don't exactly get the red carpet treatment in history and media. And unfortunately, this next story follows the trend. Back in the time of Soviet Russia, a pair of co-joined twins were born. Their names were Masha and Dasha Krivoshlayapova and they each had a head and torso, and an arm and leg each. Immediately after being born, doctors seized the girls and subjected them to inhumane treatment. The mother refused to give them up, so she was told that they died from pneumonia. The lie worked, and scientists got to carry out their sick experiments. Besides being co-joined, what made the girls so interesting to the researchers? Well, interestingly enough, Masha and Dasha had two different nervous systems while sharing a single circulatory system. Because of this fact, the scientists pushed the twins' limits to the extremes to test how their body performed. They'd make them stay awake as long as they could, sometimes for days on end. They wouldn't feed them to see how the body reacted to a state of starvation. They were injected with countless strange chemicals and substances, and much more. Their first 12 years of life were absolute torture. Thankfully, the girls were eventually set free after Stalin's rule came to an end. With two entirely different personalities, Dasha was sympathetic to those that tortured the pair, while Masha wanted them to be executed. 
Sadly, after living such a tough life, the twins passed away in 2003. They were 53 years old at the time. It's hard to imagine the effect a life of torture could have on someone, but at the very least, they had each other. 4. Model Murder One Thanksgiving took an ugly turn when a model and her husband got into a heated dispute. The 23-year-old girl, Omema Nelson, and her husband, twice her age at 56, Bill Nelson, had more than a few bumps in their marriage. The older man had repeatedly sold his beautiful young wife to other men so they could perform sexual acts on her. It happened numerous times, and Bill accepted anything from cash, rent money, to a car, in exchange for Omema's misery. In 1991, when the day should have been all about giving thanks in the country, Omema took a pair of scissors and stabbed her husband in the chest. She then took a clothing iron and hit him until he stopped moving. In the process, Omema broke her hand. According to police, when Bill was dead, she chopped his dead body up, taking his hands and boiling them in hot water to take off his fingerprints. Omema also put his head in the freezer and took his genitals off with a knife. A psychiatrist that interviewed her after she'd been taken into custody said that she admitted to something that haunt him for years. Apparently, to celebrate the holiday, Omema put her husband's ribs in the oven with some barbecue sauce, then ate them. While trying to dispose of the rest of Bill's remains, police caught her. Later on, Omema claimed that Bill would often rape her and tie her up. She said the murder was an act of self-defense since he had raped her earlier that morning, and she thought he might kill her. At trial, Omema denied eating Bill, but the jury wasn't convinced as the courtroom walls were lined with photos of Bill's deep-fried hands, frozen head, and skinned torso. She was given 27 years in prison. Three. Lovers. One October night in 2006, police were called to the scene of a suicide for a man named Zach Bowen. Strangely enough, when they reached into his pocket, they found a note detailing a gruesome murder confession. Unable to handle the guilt after killing his girlfriend, he took his own life. In the note, he gave police the address to the small apartment the couple lived in. During their relationship, Addie and Zach both had personal demons that they battled. It was believed that Addie had undiagnosed bipolar disorder, while Zach had struggled for most of his life with his self-image and confidence. Their friends said that they were often seen either drunk or high on something together. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, they thrived in the apocalypse-like environment, trading food and raiding abandoned bars. They were even labeled by news outlets at the time as the so-called king and queen of the hurricane survivors. So how did a love life like theirs turn sour? Apparently the drugs mixed with Zach's past of an ex-wife and children caused the pair to get into frequent arguments, leading to a steady off and on again relationship. Soon Addie kicked Zach out of their apartment, which made him snap. He strangled her, then raped her corpse. He soon began cutting up her body and placing it in pots, pans, and the fridge to try and dispose of it. While this seems like the average cut-and-dry murder-suicide, some paranormal enthusiasts believe there may have been another cause for the couple's demise. The apartment the two lived in was right above a voodoo shop. Some think that a sinister force or possible curse could have pushed Zack to the breaking point. But there hasn't been any proof of that. 2. Parents Are Out Crystal Brooke Howell invited several of her friends over one night and told them all that her father had killed himself earlier that day and that they could all live in their house since he was gone. The teenagers, Crystal being 17 at the time, spent the next few days driving her father's car and spending his money. But the joyride was cut short. After living it up and partying, even going so far as putting a stripper pole in her dad's kitchen, Crystal's friends eventually found a body the body of her father. The young girl had murdered him days before he had allegedly committed suicide. While talking to police, she says she decided to do it after he caught her stealing earlier the same day. She had taken a shotgun and killed him in his sleep. After he was gone, she put his body in multiple plastic tubs and hid it in the shed. To cover up her crime, Crystal went on to sell the gun she used. After her friends found out, they told the cops and Crystal was arrested. 
It's surprising that one, a daughter could kill her own father, and two, go on to have parties in the house right after the crime. Some people are just truly sick. One, maniac with a knife. In 2001, the country of Japan was shocked at one of the most heinous crimes ever committed on their soil. An adult man had broken into an elementary school and terrorized countless children. He went on a 10-minute rampage, killing eight kids and injuring 21 others. Hundreds ran away screaming and crying. Eventually, some teachers were able to take him down and restrain him before police could make it to the school. The man behind the crime was named Momoro Takuma. Apparently, he had taken a large amount of tranquilizers that left him heavily confused and in a deranged state. On top of this, he had a long history of mental illness and charges of sexual assault on his record. He was sent to prison in 2003 and executed a year later. Before his death, Takuma showed zero remorse for what he did to the children. Despite traumatizing hundreds of kids for life, he continued to have no guilt until his final breath. He was even recorded saying, I should have used gasoline, so I could have killed more than I did. Number 10. Caesar Adrio's Secret Relationship Ended Christmas can be celebrated in many ways. Unfortunately, not everyone spends the holiday spending time with loved ones, unwrapping presents, or enjoying a family meal. In 2016, when most of the world was busy with Christmas feasts and other holiday activities, Caesar Adrio from Vigo, Spain, chose a more sinister way to spend the day. He murdered his girlfriend, Ana and Jamil. The two were co-workers and had been in a secret relationship for some time, but ended abruptly six months after they moved in together. Adrio, who considered Inhamio to be extremely controlling, was not happy with the breakup. To retaliate, he showed his dominance in a gruesome way and ended up stabbing Inhamio to death. But how did he do it? The two had both attended their company's Christmas dinner, along with their other co-workers. Adrio approached his ex-girlfriend in a way that initially looked like a surprise, but soon turned deadly. He attacked Inhamio with a knife and stabbed her in her chest and neck at least 30 times. According to the autopsy report, 12 of the stabs grazed her heart and six pierced right through it. Inhamia was only 25 years old when she became a victim of Adrio's brutality. Apparently, he was delighted on seeing the defensiveless woman being tortured due to his manic delusion of dominating over her. Adrio was clearly the primary and only suspect. The jury was convinced that the convicted man had indeed attacked his ex-partner with a knife. Adrio was sentenced to 30 years and four months for murder with cruelty, the crime of harassment, and the crime of violation of privacy. He also had to compensate the family of the woman with 87,900 euro for each parent and 25,400 euro for her brother. Number nine, Christmas Parade Kills Girl. Christmas of 2018 for one unfortunate family turned out to be the worst day of their lives. Why? Their four-year-old girl was killed by a Santa Claus Christmas parade float in a small port town in Canada. A cheerful Christmas parade traumatized onlookers with a tragic twist. Everyone who was present at the parade was left in shock after witnessing a toddler fall underneath a parade float. The little one was running gleefully alongside the moving float and having the time of her life when she stumbled and fell. The little fall cost her her life. The screams and shuffle caused mayhem at the scene. She was immediately rushed to the hospital, but was pronounced dead shortly after. The incident sent waves of shock across the country, leading Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to speak in support of the grieving family. Quote, As a parent, words fail at times like this. Our thoughts are with the family of the young victim and with everyone affected. Number 8. South Carolina Christmas Parade Kills a Young Boy Unfortunately, the little girl in Canada wasn't the only kid to have a tragic Christmas parade accident. A young boy, age five, was also killed in an accident involving a float during a South Carolina Christmas parade. The boy, Amir Frazier, was being dropped off at his elementary school. The school's parking lot was close to the end of the parade's route. That's when the fatal incident occurred. As the Bluffton Christmas parade ended, little Frazier was rushed to a nearby hospital, but he didn't survive. The Bluffton County School District superintendent offered their condolences by issuing a heart-rendering statement for his family. When we miss one of our students, it's a deeply felt and personal loss. Each teacher, every school staff member, every administrator, each one of us is affected. And today, we're praying for Amir. Any Christmas time death is awful, but losing a little one during the holidays is particularly brutal. 
Number 7. Mugged at Husband's Grave A West London woman went to visit her husband's grave on Christmas Eve in 2015 and was confronted with a truly unpleasant surprise. As the woman, who was 73 years old, was cleaning her husband's tombstone, a mugger startled her from the back and snatched her handbag away. The poor woman was pushed to the ground. The accused made away with her bag, which was later recovered by an onlooker, but her wallet was missing. After stealing the purse, the mugger exited the cemetery and walked off swiftly towards the church road whilst covering his face. The woman suffered minor injuries in the incident, but did not require hospital treatment. Well-wishers raised hundreds of pounds for the 73-year-old woman after hearing the story. While it may have made up for the lost wallet, it seems it was more about making her feel supported. Christmas Eve is a pretty rotten time to choose to rob elderly women of their purses. But while in a cemetery? That's especially awful. What do you think is worse? The mugging or the location? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you're enjoying the video. Number 6. Devastating Road Accident Christmas time is filled with celebrations, spending time with family and friends, decorating the house, and shopping for loved ones. But on one such reunion celebration, a Christmas morning turned tragic for two friends. A vacation reunion of two Indian friends, Sarath Kumar and Rohit Krishna Kumar, ended in tragedy after both students were killed in a devastating road accident in Jabal Ali, Dubai. Their car collided with a tree in the wee hours of the morning of Christmas Day. Both friends died on the spot. Details of the crash remain unknown. Originally from Kerala, India, both young men were former students of DPS Dubai. Krishna Kumar was a former student at GEMS World Academy. This unfortunate incident happened while Sarath was dropping Rahit home after they met up the previous night. The two schoolmates were on vacation and planned to meet in Dubai. We assume that Sarath may have been jet-lagged and tired as both boys returned to Dubai only the day before Christmas, said family sources. Number 5. Man dressed as Santa kills ex-wife On Christmas Eve in 2020, Bruce Jeffrey Pardo knocked on the door of his ex-wife's family's home where a Christmas Eve party was being held. When an 8-year-old girl opened the door, she saw Bruce Pardo standing in front of her, dressed as Santa Claus and carrying a gift-wrapped present. She excitedly ran to greet him. Pardo, however, entered the house and immediately shot the little girl in the face and began pumping bullets into the other partygoers. Bruce Pardo then unwrapped the gift he brought, which was actually a homemade flamethrower. Using the device, he set the home on fire. He killed nine people in total, including his ex-wife, her mother, father, sister, and two brothers. Three more partygoers were wounded, including the eight-year-old girl, who thankfully survived the gunshot wound. Pardo had an elaborate escape plan in place, and while he managed to flee the crime scene, he ultimately suffered third-degree burns on his arms and was found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Number 4. Santa Claus Bank Robbery 83 years ago, ranked as one of Texas's most shocking crimes, the Santa Claus Bank Robbery led to a widespread manhunt. A drama worthy of a Hollywood movie was playing out in the busy streets of Cisco on December 23, 1927. While shoppers were hurrying to finish up their Christmas shopping, Henry Helms, Lewis Davis, Marshall Ratliff, and Robert Hill were preparing to do some shopping of their own at the First National Bank. Bank robberies were extremely common during this time, and a $5,000 reward had been offered to anyone shooting a bank robber during the crime. As a result, the Christmas caper turned extremely deadly. Ratliff, disguised as Santa, was let out a few blocks away from their target, and he and his gang approached the bank. His costume, however, attracted the notice of several children who followed him and the remaining three members of the crew into the bank. This strange scenario escalated once the group was inside. When the robbers drew their weapons and announced that it was a stick-up, a woman who entered the bank while the robbery was in progress managed to escape and inform the chief of police. And after Radcliffe filled his Santa sack with money and exited the vault, the shooting began. Initially, Robert Hill spotted someone outside and shot at them. This led to the beginning of the firefight, where several citizens hoping to reap the $5,000 reward had gathered outside of the bank and began shooting at the gang. They, of course, returned fire. The robbers grabbed hostages, forcing them towards their cars, and while most escaped, two little girls were taken. The group attempted to escape, but between the shootouts, several wounded, and general chaos, they didn't make it far. They had to abandon the car after the tires were shot out, and while they escaped for a time, they were ultimately captured. The loot, which was later returned to the bank, amounted to $12,400 in cash and $150 in non-negotiable securities. Around 200 bullet casings were found around the bank. After a long wait, the greatest manhunt in Texas was finally over. 
They were sentenced to 99 years of jail time in January 1928. After several attempts of escaping prison and being recaptured, they were finally put to death by hanging in November the same year. Number 3. Killer Santa Christmas in 2011, when a 56-year-old Texas man, Aziz Yazdanpana, entered his ex-wife's apartment while dressed in a Santa costume and fatally shot not only his ex-wife, but also their two teenage children who were opening their Christmas presents. He also shot three other relatives who were present at the home. Aziz was having problems dealing with his finances and was not happy that his separated wife was doing so well. Aziz was unemployed for almost 10 years and his wife's success after they split up could be a possible motive for the murders, people close to the family said. Aziz's niece, 22-year-old Sarah, sent a text to a friend saying they had arrived at the apartment and that Aziz was there. So we're here. We just got here and my uncle is here too. Dressed as Santa. Awesome. Sarah stated in a different text that her uncle was trying to be all fatherly and win them over, alluding to previous family tensions. I think he was probably overwhelmed when it was all said and done and decided to take his life instead, police stated. However, cops believe that the financial and marital issues were a bigger part of the suspect's motive. They were still unsure of what drove him to the murder. Number 2. Bad Santa A depraved man dressed as Santa drugged victims at a Christmas market in Berlin, including a 15-year-old girl. The accused approached the girl who was with her friend at the downtown Alexanderplatz Christmas market. He offered them a shot of alcohol and paper cups. One of the girls rejected, but the other one drank both of the shots. Soon, she started puking and had to be rushed to the hospital. The girl underwent blood testing before being released that revealed that she had indeed been drugged. Police said that her drink had been spiked with some type of date rape drug. A total of eight people who drank the spiked spirits fell ill in Berlin. Shoppers in Germany were urged to watch out for a bad Santa who was poisoning drinks at Christmas markets. The bad Santa approached victims in various locations. The accused typically handed out alcohol in small bottles and claimed to be celebrating his child's birth. Most of the victims were young women. And number one, killed over candy. A man decked out as Santa Claus, complete with a jolly red suit and gifts, stunned holiday shoppers by beating up an elderly woman. Elkin Clark, working as a mall Santa in Atlanta in December 2004, became enraged when the victim supposedly stole 29 boxes of Hershey's chocolates from him, though there were no witnesses to support his claims. According to witness, Asia Albritton, who then tried to help the old woman, Clark threatened her with the wooden board. Nelson died six weeks later due to her injuries. Clark was convicted of malicious murder as well as simple assault of Albritton. The eyewitness who called the police said he had taken a board, swung, hit her, knocked her to the ground, and then proceeded to hit her again. Clark was later found guilty of murder. Ten Fatal Bear Attack A hiker killed by a rampaging black bear left behind a photograph of the deadly animal just before he was attacked. Amazingly, the very last thing this hiker did was take a picture of the very animal that killed him. The attack occurred in West Milford's Opshawa Preserve in September. The victim was 22-year-old Darsh Patel, who had been studying at Rutgers University at the time. Darsh was with a group of friends when they encountered the bear after a long day of hiking. They came to a halt when they saw it no more than 300 feet, 91 meters away from them. Rather than being immediately afraid of the bear, Darsh took out his camera and began photographing it. After a bit of a photo shoot, the hikers turned and continued on their way. The bear had other plans. It ran up to them, causing the group to panic and split up in different directions. The bear decided to chase Darsh, who was last seen trying to scramble up a rock formation as he screamed for help while the bear was hot on his trail. This was the last time he was seen alive. Emergency responders found the body of Darsh Patel several hours later, around the same time that a police officer tracked down and shot the bear. An autopsy revealed that Darsh had been mauled to death. Pieces of his flesh were found inside the stomach of the bear. When deputies checked his cell phone, they found the last thing he did before running for his life was snap a few photos of the angry beast that would, just minutes later, tear him to shreds. Guess that bear really didn't like having his picture taken. 9. Magpie Devils 
In Australia, tragedy struck after an unfortunate encounter with a wild magpie. Magpies are known in Australia for being nuisances, very annoying birds that sometimes attack hikers and cyclists for absolutely no reason at all. They often dive bomb people's heads and terrorize them, though these unprovoked attacks never usually result in death or even serious injury. That all changed when Simone from Brisbane was going for a stroll in the park with her young baby, five-month-old Mia. The magpie must have been defending its nest because it burst out of the trees like a bat out of hell and started attacking Simone's head. The young mother was shocked by the random attack and tried to stumble away from the frantic bird. In her effort to get away, she tripped over her own feet, accidentally dropping the baby. Oh no! Little Mia was rushed to the hospital, but there was nothing doctors could do. Even before her first birthday, she was dead, and all because of an annoying bird. The family is obviously devastated, as life will never be the same for them again. According to the New York Daily News, the bird was taken by a professional animal handler and released far away in the bush. If you're wondering why it wasn't immediately killed for what it did, it's because magpies in Australia are a protected species. They aren't legally allowed to kill them, even when they accidentally murder babies. 8. Death by Turtle A man in Florida has been killed by a turtle. The turtle didn't set out to kill him, but it killed him nonetheless. David Curvin was out for a leisurely nighttime ride on his motorized bicycle when the deadly incident occurred. David was no stranger to nighttime riding, though despite all his experience, nothing could prepare him for a giant turtle sitting beside the roadway, completely invisible in the night. David crashed his motorcycle into the turtle, which caused him to lose control. He went down hard, so hard that David smashed his head on the ground, scrambled his brains, and died. According to Florida Today, the Brevard County fire rescue crews arrived at the scene to discover David's limp body and the turtle not far away. He was already dead when the emergency responders showed up. And as for the turtle, it survived with a minor injury, a small crack in its shell. It likely didn't try to trip up David on his night ride, but that's just what happened. What do you think of this story? Are turtles getting more and more murderous by the day? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. 7. Leopard in the Village In southwestern India, a man killed a violent assailant with his bare hands. But this was no ordinary assailant. It was a leopard. The big cat came out of the bushes and attacked the man's wife and daughter. The family was riding their bicycles near their small village and had never expected for a huge female leopard to mistake them for prey. The leopard was seemingly excited by the bicycles, kind of like how some dogs get excited by cars. It tried to chase down his wife and bite her ankles as she pumped hard on the pedals. The bite force of a leopard is so intense that it could easily have snapped her ankle like a skinny twig. But the husband was having nothing to do with the aggressive cat. He jumped off his bicycle and engaged the beast in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Miraculously, he managed to beat the thing to death. Although it almost cost him his own life, he was left with blood gushing out of his head and neck from the violent struggle, needing to be rushed to the hospital. His life was saved by doctors, and his wife and daughter were totally okay. It came out a few days later that the leopard had previously attacked others, including a veterinarian who had tried to track it down. 6. Eaten Alive by Bear Four friends on a camping trip to the Russian wilderness experienced the worst nightmare imaginable. It happened when a hungry predator literally ate one of the campers while his three friends could do nothing but watch. The unfortunate victim of the savage bear attack was 42-year-old Yevgeny Starkov. The friends were visiting the Yergegi Nature Park deep in Siberia, having no idea the dangers that awaited them. They were just packing up their tents for the day when the bear appeared out of nowhere. According to one of the witnesses, the bear was no more than a few feet from them. Not knowing what to do, they panicked and tried to run away. Unfortunately for Yevgeny, 
he didn't make it very far. He was unable to escape the beast and it pounced on his back. The snarling and drooling bear then tore him apart and began gnawing on his face while his friends watched in horror. After a few seconds of watching this terror unfold, the three survivors ran for their lives. Much to their dismay, the bear gave up eating their friend and then chased after them. They only managed to escape by climbing up a rock cliff. They then had to walk through the forest for seven hours without shoes to reach civilization, where they could finally call for help. But unfortunately, by the time help arrived, Yevgeny had already bled to death. 5. Bobcat Mayhem A man in North Carolina was standing outside his house when the unthinkable happened. This incredible event was caught on the man's outdoor camera. In the footage, he can be seen waving good morning to his neighbor, then sitting his morning coffee down and admiring his car. His wife then enters the camera frame carrying a small animal carrier. His wife is also screaming. As it turns out, a bobcat had come out of nowhere to attack the poor lady. Not wasting any time, the husband lurched into action. He ran around his car, got between his wife and the hungry cat, and actually managed to pick the thing up and lift it over his head. He held it over his head as if the cat were a set of dumbbells, then threw it across the yard. The neighbor he had said hi to just moments before must have heard the commotion because he ran back and helped the husband shoo the bobcat away. And seeing as this is in North Carolina, the husband can then be seen in the camera footage pulling a gun from a holster on his hip and aiming it at the bobcat. Luckily for the bobcat, it scampered away before the husband could get a clear shot. To understand why this attack occurred, we have to go back to the wife with the animal carrier. She had been carrying their dog out to the car when the bobcat saw it and decided to try to eat it. After the bobcat escaped, local authorities tracked the beast down and euthanized it. 4. Santa Fe Monkey Madness in Texas, a mysterious monkey-like monster has been spotted prowling the streets and attacking people. Terrified witnesses have described the beast as being some kind of chimpanzee, though police say the identity of the mysterious creature has not yet been confirmed. It's definitely some kind of humanoid, and it's been spotted within the city limits of Santa Fe. One witness saw the monkey monster try to steal a cat. Her name is Patricia de la Mora and she dialed 911 after seeing a primate on a street corner trying to pick up a cat and run away with it. By the time the police arrived, the creature had already vanished into the darkness and it was long gone. The next day, the monkey creature moved from cats to humans. A woman reported to the police that she spent 20 minutes hiding in her car after she was attacked by the very same monster. According to the local Santa Fe news station, the woman was quoted as saying, a monkey tried to attack her while she checked her mail. Amazingly, the police didn't manage to catch the creature. Since then, a child has been attacked, others have reported seeing the beast, and yet law enforcement personnel have come up short each and every time. The monkey has still not been caught, and it's wreaking havoc in Santa Fe. 3. Raging Bull in Punjab, India, a raging bull stormed into a house filled with workers and tried to kill everyone inside. Somehow, everyone managed to get away without any injury, but it was a very close call. According to the local news, the bull had gotten thrown into a fit of rage after facing off with another bull outside. Angry and with nowhere to go, the bull broke into the workshop where about half a dozen men were sitting quietly. At least, they were quiet until the bull smashed through the front door. Everyone inside scrambled and tried to get away while the beast smashed apart everything in the room and tore the place to pieces. The workers managed to scramble out the door just in time, but it must have been a terrifying few seconds. This was a fully grown bull, hundreds of pounds heavy with massive horns on his head that it could use to gouge a person's insides out. In the end, the bull eventually calmed down and walked out the front door as if nothing happened. The owners of the workshop came home to find their place in ruins, and the bull already long gone. 2. Rabid Fox at the Roller Coaster Park A family in Virginia got a little more than they bargained for on their most recent family vacation. 
Instead of having a fun day riding roller coasters, they ended up at the hospital after a rabid fox came out of nowhere and tried to eat them. According to Jamie Weiss himself, the family was just minding their own business when the attack occurred. They had only been at the park for about an hour when the fox sprinted onto the path in front of them, then leaped at their son, Donovan, as if it wanted to tear him apart. It grabbed hold of the child's leg and shook, but Jamie was able to pry the animal off and throw it into the bushes. That didn't stop it for long. The animal came back and attacked again, two more times. By the time the fox finally left them alone and retreated, Donovan was left with a puncture wound on his leg. The family had to ditch their roller coaster vacation and go to the hospital so that Donovan could get a rabies shot. But don't worry, it wasn't all bad. After the family got their shots, they returned to the park to finish off their day. They weren't about to let a rabid fox ruin the final day of their family vacation. 1. Dog Madness Two young girls were recently taken to the hospital after narrowly escaping a brutal dog attack. They were minding their own business, walking down the street at about 12.30 in the afternoon when the animal set its sights on them. The dog ran across the street, bursting onto the scene out of nowhere. It seemed intent on getting the children, and although the mother tried to defend her kids as best as possible, the dog was so big and so vicious that it overpowered her. Luckily, the attack happened inside of a cul-de-sac. It was also in the middle of the afternoon, so there were a lot of people around. A man named Mr. Baig heard the commotion and came to the rescue. As he rushed to help, the dog had one of the girl's ankles in its teeth, about to snap her bones with its powerful jaws. Mr. Baig kicked the beast a few times until it let go and scampered away. The crisis was averted, the kids were taken to the hospital, and the dog disappeared just as quickly as it had come. Would you rather be forced to move for your own safety after finding out that someone put a hit out on your life, or find out that someone you considered a friend had been low-key stealing from you for years? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.